preparing to go for their peewee program time but let's grab our songbooks we're going to go to number 139 in the red in the blue songbook excuse me number 139 let's all stand please and we'll sing the first second and the fifth verse of i know who i have believed number 139 number 139 sing it out Join in the first i know now what for their grandchildren, right? Amen. 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 Well, let's open up with a word of prayer. And we will continue. Brother England, could you please pray for us? Heavenly Father, thank you again, Lord, for the time that we gather here in your house, Lord, come here early. Things aside, we be thankful for your word, Lord, to do what we should do. Praise and bless the music and the program. Preaching tonight, Lord, and your will be done at all. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to number 227. Number 227, Saved by the Blood of the Crucified One. We'll sing the first, third, and the fourth verse, number 227. Save by the blood of the crucified 
on the crucified Amen. one. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, right. but according to his mercy he saves us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So before we get to our announcements, we're going to have our Pee Wee Club program time. Josiah 
and Jonathan. Okay, so thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to them. Amen. Aren't they doing a good job? Didn't they yeah, sing so good? Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's grab our song books. I'm sorry. Let's go to the announcements right quick. And uh, then we will go to our last song. I'm just raring to sing. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you. Y'all raring to sing? Amen. Amen. Quick announcements and then we'll get into our next song. Uh, ladies, your craft night coming up is March 29th. So if you're planning on coming, please uh, just sign up on the bulletin board and let us know uh, what finger foods you, you'll be bringing that night. Also, um, if you'd like to become a member of Harvest Baptist Church, please see Pastor Daniel about, uh, see me about joining. And we have family forums. We'd like to uh, um, be able to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and different things like that. And uh, we can uh, get that cared for. Also, uh, Brother Eric Johansson, one of our uh, longtime members who passed away, uh, I believe, late January, early February. He, the family has uh, uh, coordinated and decided to have a memorial service, and that will be on April 13th. And so uh, April 13th here at the church, 3 p.m. downstairs, and uh, the, 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 uh, it'll be a service and a light luncheon, so uh, that will be downstairs. And then the, there will be a shower for Mrs. Daniel the following Saturday downstairs in the Fellowship Hall on April 20th at noon. So um, please be aware of that, and uh, it's going to be a girl, so uh, just so that you know. Also, next, next Sunday is Easter. We're planning an Easter egg candy hunt. And with the, with the kids, make it a fun time for them. And uh, if you would like to help donate with some individually wrapped candies, that would be great. If you could just have them here by Wednesday. And that uh, you can set them down by the church uh, office downstairs and we'll know uh, where they go. And also, uh, if you're ordering any flowers in memory of a loved one for Easter Sunday, as we do every year, if you could just make sure that you sign up on the bulletin board sign-up sheet and we need the money so that we can make the order this week and have them in by Friday and have them set up for this next weekend. So I want to make sure everybody's aware of that. All right. Anybody have uh, maybe a couple couple blessings that you'd like to share? Yes, Ms. Tompkins. We got to celebrate Kyle's birthday yesterday. He turned 40 on the 19th. Wow. And Adam was 40 on the 21st. So we celebrated his birthday yesterday. Amen. Oh, that's exciting. Good. Good, good. Oh, my goodness. That, that's a weight off their mind, just normalcy. That's great. That's great. Praise the Lord. That's great. Yeah, uh, uh, Lucy. Uh, at our grandparents' got to go to church, yeah, I got to press. Yay. Yeah, we're happy about that, too. Amen. Caleb. Uh, we Amen. Praise the God that we got to sing. Amen. Anybody else? At the estimate, Miss Tolman. That's great. Oh, oh my goodness. Amen. Y'all are just multiplying in greatness. Six. You're just multiplying in greatness. Wow, five this year. Oh my goodness. And we're only in March. Amen. <laughs> yeah. We got time for more. Right? Yes, sir. I don't know if you remember last time we were here. I asked you to pray for my friend Harold, my neighbor. Okay. Yes. Well, I just want to report back that Harold is doing just fine. Ever hey, since man. then, it's like it's almost Lord. like the next day he started recovering and he's doing well. I think I had coffee with him this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the so Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank yeah. you, Lord, for hearing prayers. Amen. Thanks for sharing. That's an encouragement to us. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Caleb. Say it again. I'm gonna get a baby soon. That's right. He's looking for that baby sister of his. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anybody else? That's what you want to praise. Yes, Emilio. My birthday's passed. Your birthday's <laughs> passed. Praise the Lord. And then my birthday's way far away. <laughs> Amen. 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 Anybody else? All right. Yes, sir, Brother Tony. Uh, man that we met through the jail ministry at Audi, you know, knows us. Yes. Right yes. He just wanted to share that after the preaching. One night, he said he went back to the barracks and uh, prayed for Steve Price to save him. Amen. You know, he got saved. So. Praise the Lord. He told me yesterday morning over in Jackson's restaurant. Amen. Amen. I'm yeah. telling you, if, if you're not... 
you're not involved in jail ministry, they're, they're very hungry, very hungry. Ask Brother, Brother Tompkins about what you can do. Maybe you're like, well, I don't think I could uh, speak. Well, you could visit with them. You, you could just shake their hands and be there and pray with them. And it just, it means a lot to them. They're very hungry. Yes, he also shared that he had to go to another place for rehab and that they won't have any church service there. And he asked if he could lead a service there. And they said, go for it. So he was able to lead some church service. Amen. 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 He was pretty excited. So. Multiplying. Yeah. Multiplying a jail ministry in Nicaragua. Yeah. Multiplying a rehab service. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Elena, you had your hand raised? Oh, no. Um, somebody else had their hand. She did. Oh. Um, Okay, it's big. Anybody else have a have a blessing you want to share? Yes, Jim. Me, my sister, my mom, and my grandma went out to lunch today. That's a blessing. Yes. To spend time together. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. I got ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Revival. <laughs> Revival's happening. Hey, man, what kind of ice cream? Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let's grab our song books. We're going to go to number 373 as we stand, please. Number 373, we'll sing the first, second, and the fifth verse of So Send I You. Number 373. So Send I You. Think of the words as you sing. Join me the first. So Send I You. Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1. We ask Brother Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Jonah chapter 1. Good evening. Open your Bibles to the book of Jonah. We'll be reading verses uh, 1 through 17. So we'll be reading the first chapter of the book of Jonah. Now the word of, jo of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of At Amitel saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. 
And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thy occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood for thou. Thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Verse 17 together. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for gathering us back here together tonight, Lord, to hear your word preached from this pulpit, Lord. We ask you now that uh, give our pastor what he needs to give us, Lord, that we can apply it as we start our weeks, Lord, uh, starting in school and in work tomorrow, Lord, where our test really comes. And uh, may we be faithful what you called us to do, Lord, not run from your presence, not run from what you call us to do, Lord, but we see what can happen when, that, when we do that, Lord, but to be obedient to your word and honor you and be faithful to all you called us to do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If I were to ask a raise of hands as far as your favorite Bible character, what would it be? Jesus, of course. Yeah. I believe everybody would say Jesus, okay? So that's everybody's number one, okay? The, the second most favorite. Elena? Um, Joseph. Joseph. In the Old Testament, that's one of my favorites as well. Anybody else have a favorite Bible character? Yes. Peter. He always had a different view. Yes. Yes. Peter's. Amen. Anybody? Yes, a preacher. David. David, yes. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Ariana. Leah. Leah, yes. Leah, she's a very special lady in the Bible. Amen. Anybody else? Have a favorite Bible character? Yes, sir, Berlinus. I like Job. Job, yes. So many truths. Wow, so many truths. They say that Job is, uh, was the oldest book written. And can you imagine for all these thousands of years how, how many people he has encouraged through his trial? Millions and millions of people who have heard of his story and have gotten encouragement because of him. Wow. Amen. What, a, what an influence he has. Anybody else? Ruth. I love Ruth. Ruth. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. One of my least favorite characters would be Jonah. <laughs> I read this story and my blood boils. I just... Jonah, you have to understand that the Bible was not written, is not laid out chronologically. So Jonah is during the time of the kings. He's during the time, of, and I'm thinking this right on, on top of my head, but it's uh, during the, the time of the kings. And you can, you can find, maybe somebody can raise their hand, preacher or Brother Tompkins, who knows that detail, what king uh, he, was, he was during the time of. But Jonah, he, he's not after... Um, the captivity, he's not at, at, you know, when they came back. He is during the time of the kings. But Jonah, I'm telling you, like I said, he is one of my least favorite characters. That's why I know the Bible 
is the word of God Amen. because it has the warts yeah. included. There you go. It doesn't, God doesn't cover it up. Yeah. He doesn't cover it up. If, I would, if he was trying to be deceptive, he would have kept this book out. Yeah. He would have said, no, no, that's going to that's gonna, uh, 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 cause people to, 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 to think negatively. So I want to I I gloss it over. No, God said, no, nope, you need to know this. You need to know this. You need to know the depths that uh, even a Christian could go to. Yeah. And uh, it is sad. It is sad. This evening we're going to talk about the selfishness of Jonah. The selfishness of Jonah. Heavenly Father, I praise, it, praise and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to come to church and to look at your word. I pray that you please help us to learn a lesson from this fellow believer. Lord, you're so gracious that even when we're not perfect, you keep your promises with us, even though we don't deserve it. I pray you please help us to learn lessons from that. From this man and and not repeat it and, and and learn your heart and why you were working with him i pray that you please fill me with your holy spirit help me to be able to explain it in a way that we can all gather something and learn something lord i need your help i pray in jesus name amen, amen. <clears throat> jonah lived during a time when the people of nineveh were causing a lot of hurt and harm to the area around them. To begin the message this evening, I want to read this story, a portion of a story. In Ernest Gordon's true account of life in a World War II Japanese prison camp in the book called Through the Valley of Kwai, there's a story named about there is a story about a name, man named Angus McGivory. Angus was a Scottish prisoner in one of the camps filled with Americans, Australians, and Britons who had helped build the infamous bridge over the River Kwai. The camp had become an ugly situation. A dog-eat-dog -dog mentality had set in. Allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would sleep on their packs and yet have them stolen from under their heads. Survival was everything. The law of the jungle prevailed until the news of Angus McGillivray's death spread throughout the camp. Rumors spread in the wake of his death. No one could believe Big Angus had succumbed. He was strong, one of those whom they had expected to be the last to die. Actually, it wasn't the fact of his death that shocked the men, but the reason he died. Finally, they pieced the story together. Jonah had been told by God to go to the great city Nineveh and deliver God's message of judgment to them. As you read through God's word, before he has ever, before he has ever brought judgment upon a people, he has always sent warning. God is not going to be accused in the judgment that he did not give people a fair chance. Yeah. He will lay out all the evidence. These are all the things that I did to warn you. Jonah was being used as an instrument of God to let the people of Nineveh know that judgment was coming. They had committed some pretty atrocious things on the peoples around them, including Israel, Possibly, people speculate, including in the life of Jonah, which made him very angry towards them yeah. and very, very spiteful and hateful towards them. And he wanted them to all die. Yeah, that's right. But God said, I want you to go and I want you to warn these people of an impending judgment. And Jonah, his hard attitude was, I don't want them to be warned. Wipe them off the face of the earth, God. Yeah. Send a nuclear bomb. Yeah. They didn't even have nuclear bombs back then. But do something to, to evaporate them. Because the hate that was in his heart towards them. This was a believer. This is one who believed. This was a man of God who had this spirit in his heart. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The, 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 the amazing grace of God that dealing with Jonah in this heart attitude. Jonah ref refused. Jonah, he ran the other way. He went down to Joppa. And Joppa is is uh, still in existence today. You can look on the map of Israel, and it's not called exactly by the name Jaffa, but it's very close. I think it's Jaffa. 
uh, nowadays. But you, can, you, you know that it's down there. It's on the coast. And he got a ship that was going to Tarshish. Tarshish, is in the, if I'm not mistaken, is in the area of Spain, in the Mediterranean Sea area. So you're, you're going to the very opposite end. Nineveh was to the east towards the, the Middle East, Iraq, uh, uh, Pakistan area. And, and Tarshish was towards Spain. And, and I'm, I'm pointing it in reference of my, so it's, it's going to be opposite for you. But he ran the opposite direction, running from the presence of the Lord. Jonah knew what he was doing. Yeah. He knew what he was doing. Yet he didn't care. Yet he didn't care. On this trip, the ship was caught in a violent storm. If you read in Acts, you'll find that as Paul was being taken to Rome... They loosed from a certain island and they were caught in a storm called Eurachlodon. It was a, pretty much a hurricane there in the waters. Jonah, it sounds like he was also caught in a hurricane, a very violent storm. Jonah, he was asleep on the side of the boat, down in the, down in the hull of the boat. Totally unaware and unaffected by it all. When selfishness consumes a person, it causes them to totally check out on how it's, how it's affecting everybody around them. It's, it's, it's pretty sad. Yeah. And Jonah, he is a very sad example of selfishness. It was during this storm that the others on the boat started searching for answers as to why this was happening to them. Everyone was scared. Everyone was scared. These were mariners. These were seamen. And they were scared. You remember the time when Jesus was with the disciples and I believe we read it this morning and they were caught in a storm and these were fishermen. These were men who had seen this type of stuff, yet they were scared. They thought they were going to die. These were mariners. These were men who had seen storms. They had battled storms, but they were, they were scared. It was shaking them. Everyone was praying. When, when, when you can get people who don't worship God to start praying, telling you like one man said there's no atheist in a foxhole in the middle of a battle there's no atheist i'm sorry when 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 your life is dangling by a thread everyone's praying yeah. all of a sudden everybody's starting to to to, to reach out to a god yeah. everyone but jonah sometimes i sometimes i i wonder if if these doctrines of eternal security uh plant too much apathy in god's children they, they know that God can't break his word. They know that they're secure in, in, in they're sealed by, until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. And so they get an attitude where it doesn't matter what happens to the world. I'm secure. Yeah. It's sad. It's sad. Everyone was scared. Everyone was praying. Everyone but Jonah. He still slept. You know, it's amazing and sad when the unsaved world has to slap a believer out of their sleep when the sky is falling all around everyone. It's sad. Look what Jonah, look what verse 5 says. The mariners were afraid and cried unto every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. The utter selfishness of a backslidden believer is astounding. Yeah. <clears throat> they, cost, they cast lots to figure out who was causing this storm to come. The lots fell on Jonah. And Jonah told them plainly in verse 8, he says, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? Verse 9, And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. Why have you done this? It's pretty sad when the world looks at a child of God and says to them, why are you doing this? Yeah. You're hurting everybody around you, yet you don't care. Yeah. It's 
It's pretty sad when unsafe people ask a supposed believer this. That turns so many hearts away from trusting the Lord. That's right. When a believer gets that backslid and that cold and that callous, it turns their heart away. It's like, it's not even for real with you. Then the men, they sought a way for a way to rectify the situation. But I want, you to, I want us to notice the utter selfishness of Jonah here. <clears throat> Look at verse 12. These men are trying to spare their lives. They're trying to calm, to, to do something to, 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 to make it through this storm. Verse 12, it says, this is Jonah speaking. Jonah tells them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. The first thing I want to notice about or us to notice about his selfishness is that number one, Jonah knew why the storm had come. He said, I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. He was running from God and he didn't care. He refused to obey the clear commands of God. God told him, I want you to go to Nineveh. He said, no, flat out and went the other way. Look at these verses. Look at verse four. It says, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Have you ever been on a fishing boat in rough water? One time, my boys and I, we went out with someone on Lake Erie. And it was a relatively calm day, but the waters were rougher than what I had ever been accustomed to. I did not enjoy that, that boat ride. There were no white caps, but there were some swells. But I couldn't get my balance on the boat. And one time, I dropped his pole into the water. We had to fish it out. And I almost fell in. It's like, I'm not having fun. I'm not having fun. This is, this is a small boat. But that was just, just with a little bit of wind. I can't imagine having rougher waters. And it says the ship was like to be broken. You could hear the creaks of the boards and the crashing of the waves. You could hear it all. And, and these mariners, they had, they had sea experience. And they, they were like, Man, this, this is unlike any storm I've ever experienced. Look at verse 5. It says, Then were the mariners, the mari then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. The mariners, these experienced seamen, were afraid. They threw everything overboard at a great expense to their livelihood. That was their livelihood. They would take on products in the different ports and then go and try to trade them and make some money. And they had to, because of Jonah, because of his selfishness, he had, they had to throw it all away. Yeah. They totally had to impoverish themselves. They were going to try to take this home and be able to help pay for their family's needs. But because of Jonah, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah, amen. Verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. They, after already exhausting themselves, rode hard trying to get the boat closer to land for Jonah's sake. For this one who didn't deserve it. Can, can you see the heart of these, these men? They, they, weren't, they didn't know about God, but they were sincere in the fact that this was a fellow human being and, and we're gonna, we want to try to get him close to land so that he his blood is not on our hands. Jonah knew why this storm had come. Number two, another thing I noticed about his selfishness was Jonah witnessed how it was affecting everyone around him. He witnessed it. He watched it. His selfishness had him so wrapped up in himself that he was unaware, unaware of the loss he was causing them. When they were throwing all the tackling and all the wares of the ship, what, did he speak up? Did he say anything? 
He didn't say anything. He eyewitnessed all this due to his rebellion. He, he witnessed how it was affecting everyone around him. It's sad. It's sad when the child of God is so wrapped up in himself. And they see everybody around them in pain. And they're asleep to it all. Go to verse 12. In verse 12 it says, And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Can, do you hear what he's saying? Number three, his selfishness was such that Jonah forced them to do something about it. He said, I know this tempest is here, but I'm going to make you grab me and throw me overboard. If, if, if you're the cause of the storm, Jonah, how about you just walk off the boat, okay? But no, you're going to make them take you by the hands and do something about it? His selfish rebellion forced them to throw all their wares overboard. His selfish rebellion forced them to cast lots to find the culprit. They had to go through the process. All of this was happening. He's sleeping. He wakes up. And, and, and he it's like Achan. Yeah. Achan didn't say anything after he stole from Jericho. Yeah. He made Joshua go through the process instead of saying, listen, I just want to confess. He probably could have found some mercy before God, but he made God dig it out. And Achan and his whole family and all that he possessed ended up being stoned in the valley of Achor. Yeah. And Jonah, he forced these men, knowing the storm is here because of me, he made them go through the process to dig it out. Forced them to cast lots to find the culprit. Maybe, maybe he would, maybe it was somebody else, maybe he could get away with it. His selfish rebellion forced them to take him up and throw him overboard. Had they ever done that before? Had they ever, on purpose, thrown somebody overboard? Probably not. Think about it. What would their conscience think about that? Taking somebody and throwing him overboard? You don't do that. You, you try to save mankind. You try to save your fellow man. You try to put, throw the, the life ring out there and try to, try to bring them up back on the ship. You don't throw them overboard. What would their conscience think about that? How would they process this when they get to port and, and they're, 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 they're in, they're straggling, and they can barely get a, a, a cup of water at, at, the, at the restaurant, and they're telling, they're like, what happened to y'all? And he tells the story, man, this storm came along, and this, we had to throw this guy overboard, and the sea became calm, and a fish, whoo, Swallowed him up. I saw it with my own eyes. I couldn't believe it. What a coward. What a coward Jonah was. Throw your, throw your own stuff overboard, Jonah. You know. You know why this storm is here. Throw your own stuff. Just walk off the side of the boat and be a blessing to everybody else. I'm getting in the flesh. Sorry. Verse 13. Look at it. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. These unsaved, these unbelievers, these ones who had never heard of the gospel of the Messiah, the coming Messiah, they had a mercy and tenderness in their heart toward their fellow man and tried their best to go towards land so that he could be dropped off there and they could go on on their way. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Verse 14, wherefore they cried unto the Lord and, they, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, has done as it pleased thee. Number four, something else I noticed about the Selfishness of Jonah is Jonah brought guilt upon their conscience for what he forced them to do to him. He brought a guilty conscience upon them. They were crying to this God of Jonah that they had never heard about. But they were crying to him and saying, God, we beseech you, we beg you, we beg you, please don't lay this innocent blood on us. Don't curse us because of what we're having to do to this guy to bring peace and survival to us. He brought guilt on their consciences 
for what he forced them to do. They begged for Jonah's God to not charge them for taking Jonah's innocent blood. Supposedly, in their minds, they, Jonah had never done them wrong. The wrong Jonah had done had been against God, but they were caught in the middle of it. And so they were begging for Jonah's God to not charge them for the taking the, his innocent blood. And they were caught, they were, this is sad, they were cursed because of Jonah's presence. That's pretty bad. When a child of God causes the, 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 the children of the world to be cursed, when it goes horrible for the children of the world because of the presence of a child of God, that's sad. That's sad. But he brought guilt upon their consciences for what he forced them to do. Go to verse 15. It says, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Number five, Jonah's extreme punishment caused them to turn to God. Isn't that amazing? His extreme punishment, what they had to do to him, and then the results after they tossed him overboard and he broke the plane of that water, he broke the plane and the sea all of a sudden became peaceful. What in the world just happened? And they saw this fish swallow him up and take him under. But his extreme punishment caused the turn, the, them to turn to God. That's a, say, that's, a sad ways to be, that's a sad way to be used as a soul winning tool for God. Yeah. We, ought to be, we, we ought to understand that we all have this capability. If you're a child of God, we all have this capability of getting so wrapped up in our own, our own self and our own life and become so selfish we can become like a Jonah. Yeah. And God punishing us will bring people to his kingdom. I don't want to be used in that way. I would rather lead them to Jesus Christ rather than get spanked and then them say, wow, you know what? I'm going to get saved because he got spanked. Yeah. These mariners' hearts and lives were changed. Were changed after this. Did you notice what it says in verse 16? Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. They made commitments to the God of heaven because of Jonah's punishment. Their lives were changed because of Jonah's punishment. But Jonah's was not. Jonah's was not. Can you believe it? Go to chapter 2 and verse 2. Look at what Jonah said in chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, then in verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Now catch this part. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Jonah thought he had died and gone to hell. Imagine being in a great, there, there's been reports where great white sharks have swallowed men. And the gastric juices inside those beasts, they, they, it's like acid, it burns the skin. And the Bible says that the lake of fire is of fire and brimstone. Jonah thought he was in hell. And he said, out of the belly of hell, cried I. Jonah described this well experience as being like in the belly of hell. The stench, the burning all over, being marinated in gastric juices. You can imagine. One would think that Jonah's outlook on life would have changed after this experience. Did it change Jonah's heart? God speaks to Jonah again to go to Nineveh after the whale spits him back out on the land. It makes me, it makes me wonder if the whale had a belly ache because he had a backslidden Christian in his belly and couldn't stand the taste of a backslidden Christian. Even the, even the fish of the sea can't stand a backslidden Christian. He gets spit up on the land and God speaks to him, go to Nineveh. This time he obeys. He preaches, and the city has a revival. Now remember what he just experienced. He just experienced 
in his mind, being in the belly of hell, praying to God and God hearing him. Chapter 3 and verse 10, God is, speak, is talking about God here, seeing their works, the works of the, the Ninevites as a response to the preaching of Jonah. Look what it says. And God saw there, speaking of the people of Nineveh, their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But look at verse 1 of chapter 4, the very next verse. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Can you believe this guy? Can you believe this guy? You would think that from the belly of hell, the, the whale's belly being marinated in gastric juices and all that, that pain that he was going through, that it would have shaken his heart and softened his heart toward living people. But when he did obey the Lord and God repented, God saw their works, God turned, they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil, he, and the, 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 the judgment that he wanted to bring on Nineveh, the next verse says that Jonah, he was, just, he was mad about it. He was angry about it. Angry that God had changed his mind. What? Jonah now reveals the disgustingness of his heart. And this is a believer. This is, this is one who called himself a child of God. But this is how bad a child of God can be. You see, God has to keep his word. You see, our salvation is not dependent on our works. It's dependent on what we do with the word of God. Amen. God does such a work of grace in our heart, and he puts that righteousness of him and Jesus Christ upon us when we receive Christ as our Savior. And we're not saved because of our good works. We're not saved because, because we have merited it somehow. Yeah. It's because we believe his promise, and he has to fulfill that promise. But sadly, some people are too saved. And they take advantage of the grace and mercy and the promises of God and they go to the extreme as we see Jonah's doing. Jonah is now revealing the disgustingness of his heart. Just because you, you, you are a child of God doesn't mean that this old flesh can't make you look like the child of the devil. Yeah. That's right. So now Jonah, he's revealing the disgustingness of his heart. I can't believe, I can't even believe that Jonah had the audacity to pray to the Lord. Look what he does. Much less say what he says in prayer. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. I wish it would have stopped right there. But he had the audacity to go to verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord. <laughs> and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was that not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and great kindness and repentance of the, of, the, of the evil. Is that a problem, Jonah? Is that a problem? You see how messed up Jonah was? He was so messed up in his mind, had so much hatred toward these people that all these great qualities of God, he didn't want them to, 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 to experience at all. Jonah was actually angry at God for God sparing Nineveh. I, I, I can't believe that. Yeah. It reveals the depths of Jonah's selfishness. Jonah said, God, I knew you were a gracious God. Back in my home country, I knew you were a gracious God. I knew you were a merciful God. I knew you were a God that is slow to anger. I knew you were a God that is, that is of great kindness. I knew you were a God... You are a God that would repent of the evil that you had in mind in Nineveh, and I didn't want you to repent. I wanted you to wipe them off the face of this map. Yeah. And God, do you know what else I know? This is Jonah talking. I know, look at verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I know it's better for me to die than to live. Do you, do, do Jonah? You, you, you think it's better for you to die than to live? What a terrible example of a believer. 
What a terrible, terrible example. I've got to tell you, he's one of my least favorite people in the Bible. He boils my blood. But we can all be just like him. Yeah. Why? Why? Why was Jonah's heart like this? Why was Jonah's heart like this? I jotted some thoughts down. He, number one, he knew that his heart wasn't right with God. He knew his heart wasn't right with God. He, number two, he knew that his heart was filled with hate toward the Ninevites. Number three, he knew his spirit was poisoned with bitterness against them. For some, it's, it's unknown what happened in his life. People have speculated. But it's, it's unknown but for some reason, there was some, some bitterness against the people of Nineveh. They, they, they were some ruthless people. They were some very, very wicked people. You could say they were the terrorists of their day. Right. You see these videos of people and, and American soldiers and, and, and these terrorists videoing, doing atrocious things with the sword. If you catch my meaning. Yeah. And it's, oh my goodness, oh, that was the Ninevites of the day. Yeah. They, were, they were cruel people. He knew that his spirit was poisoned with bitterness against them. And he knew his sinful nature was addicted to hating them. He was addicted to hating them. You know, when you, when you have those, those hateful feelings in your heart, it starts releasing hormones in your body, and your body actually can get addicted to it. You, you, yeah, yeah, that's why God says you need, you need to cast all your care upon the Lord. You need, you need to get this thing right because you're going to get addicted to this, this, hate, this drug of hate, this hormone in your body that is produced, and, and it's going to consume you. And you're going to go off the deep end. He knew that his sin, sinful nature was addicted to hating them, and he loved that drug more than he did all the goodness of God given to them. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Can you believe his reaction to God when God repented of the evil that he had in mind for the Ninevites? Instead of rejoicing, instead of praising the Lord, he was angry at God. This is how despicable Jonah's heart was. Go to chapter 4, verse 8. It says, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. See, what had happened is Jonah had preached the revival. Everybody in the city had gotten right. For all the way to the king, all the way to the, to the smallest understanding child, so Jonah, he went off on the hillside to watch God bring judgment upon Jonah, uh, upon Nineveh, and God didn't do it. And, he, and Jonah was ticked. He was mad. He was mad. He wanted, them to, he wanted to watch the nuclear bomb hit and boom, disintegrate him. God never sent it. So God, in one night, caused a gourd to grow. And it provided shade for the next day. It was a vehement east wind that was, that was blasting upon him. And it was providing a little bit of relief. That night, a worm, God prepared a worm. And that worm chewed off the vine and caused the gore to die the next day. And Jonah was mad. Jonah was mad because he was uncomfortable. And this is what he says. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Look at what he says in verse 9. And God says to Noah, dost thou well to be, do, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And Jonah says, I do well to be angry even unto death. Jonah was insolent. He was rebellious. He was hateful. He was spiteful. He was such a selfish believer. It's, it is pathetic. Contrast Jonah to this man. Rumors spread in the wake of Angus's death. No one could believe Big Angus had succumbed. He was strong, one of those whom they had expected to be the last to die. Actually, it, was the fact of his, it wasn't the fact of his death that shocked the men, but the reason he died. Finally, they pieced together the true story. The Argyles, or the Scottish soldiers, took their buddy system very seriously. Their buddy was called their mucker. And these Argyles, these Scottish soldiers, believed that it was literally up to each of them to make sure their mucker survived, their partner 
Angus' mother, though, was dying, and everyone had given up on him. Everyone, of course, except Angus. He had made up his mind that his friend would not die. Someone had stolen his mucker's blanket, so Angus gave him his own, telling his mucker that he had just come across an extra one. Likewise, every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and tell them to and take them to his friend, stand over him, and force him to eat them, again stating that he was able to get extra food. Angus was going to do anything and everything to see that his buddy got what he needed to recover. But as Angus's mucker began to recover, Angus collapsed, slumped over, and died. The doctors discovered that he had died of starvation complicated by exhaustion. He had been giving his, giving his own food and shelter. He had given everything he had, even his very life. The ramifications of this, his acts of love and unselfishness had a startling impact on the compound. As word circulated of the reason for Angus McGillivray's death, the feel of the camp began to change. Suddenly, men began to focus on their mates, their friends, and humanity of living beyond survival, of giving oneself away. They began to pool their talents. One was a violin maker. One was an, another was an orchestra leader. Another was a cabinet maker. Another a professor. Soon the camp had an orchestra full of homemade instruments and a church called Church Without Walls that was so powerful, so compelling, that even the Japanese guards attended. The men began a university, a hospital, and a library system. The place was transformed and love for their fellow man revived. All because one man named Angus gave all he had for his friend. For many of those men, this turnaround meant survival. They learned the potential that is unleashed when one person actually gives it all away. Yeah. Amen. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man that a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen. Why was God so concerned about the city and people of Nineveh? I want you to turn to the very last verses of Jonah. Look at how God ends the story. It's the only book in the Bible that ends with a question. Look at what God, why was so God so worried and so concerned and so, so tender-hearted toward Nineveh? Let's read. Jonah 4 verse 10 says, Then said the Lord to Jonah, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? Who in this church cannot discern between their right hand and their left? Anybody in this room? Anybody outside this room? Who? The children. Six score thousand. How many is that? A score is 20. Six times 20 is 120,000 children. Children in the city of Nineveh. Why, would, why shouldn't God be tenderhearted towards the children? Were they not worth it? Yeah. To God, they were. But not to a self-centered believer. Yeah. Isn't that sad? May the Lord help us. Amen. May the Lord keep our hearts tender. That we don't let the trials of life right. poison us with such bitterness. That, we're, that, we, that we would be okay with 120,000 children being exterminated. All because we think they deserve it. Yeah. They didn't do anything about that. And God knew that. God had tenderness and pity on his, in his heart towards these little kids. They weren't responsible for what their parents were doing. God wanted to do something about it. And he wanted his man to go. And he, he wanted his man to go and share the love of Christ with them. But he was so poisoned with bitterness, so wrapped up in his own hurt, in his own aching heart, or whatever was going on, that he didn't care who he destroyed in his wake. 
he didn't care. That he wasn't going to go. And he actually got angry with God. May the Lord, may the Lord use this example of a, I want to say a very bad child of God. <laughs> we could all be there if we're not careful. Amen. We could all be there. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us during the trial times, during the hurtful times, to utilize the tools that we have to extract the bitterness out of our hearts so that we don't get to this level of, of hate in our hearts like a Jonah. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for these examples in your word. Thank you so much for, for showing us just how bad one of your child, one of your children could, could dip down to. May we be careful of that. May, may we look at the, the hard times of our life and the, the bitter times of our life and not allow the bitterness, the root of bitterness to, to spring up in our hearts and, and, and defile us and cause us to, to be this, so, this self-centered and this, this angry at you. Help us, Lord, to see this as a warning. Help us, Lord. Lord, I, I want to praise and thank you, Lord, that even though Jonah was such a horrible example of a believer, that your promises to him of his salvation, they never wavered because you are a God that keeps your word even when we don't deserve it. Amen. And I thank you for that. Please help us, Lord. Protect us from these real challenges of life. Protect us from bitterness. Protect us from hate and anger. Protect our hearts from deep hurts. I pray that you'd please reach down into the depths of our heart and heal those hurts. Do what only you can do. Put your hand of healing on it. All you have to do is touch it. And you can heal that hurt. So that we don't end up being like a Jonah. And it, the hurt just consumes us and makes us bitter and poisons our whole outlook on life. And everyone around us is, is hurt because of our presence. I pray, Lord, you please help us to take this warning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. I'm going to have some of this play hymn of invitation. The altar's open. We need to do business with the Lord. How about you come and do business with the Lord? There's some aches in your heart, some hurts, some trials that you're, that you're struggling with. Come and ask the Lord, Lord, please heal my heart. Heal my heart. I don't want to get to this horrible level of behavior towards my fellow man where I'm so wrapped up with myself and, and my hurt that I'm willing to, 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 to cause all kinds of death to people around me. And I don't care for them at all. Please, Lord, help me. He can help you. He can help you. Just ask and he will. Just pray.
34, number 334. Let's sing the first and second verse of number 334 as our closing hymn. The first and second verse. will come yeah. it is impossible to live in this world with other fellow sinners and not be offended yeah. psalm says great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them yeah. offenses are going to come but when you are so in love with god's law it's almost like he gives you anesthesia of the soul or if you've ever had a baby, epidural of the soul. <laughs> it just takes the pain away. I've said it many times. The trials of life come and, and, and it's, it's almost like your soul goes through a shredder. Like the, the cat claws. <laughs> and it's all jaggedy. And it hurts. The memories hurt and thinking about it and you want to just block it out. But you can go to God and you can explain to him that how your soul is feeling and ask him, Lord, would you please heal that? Amen. And God can take his healing hand and touch it. Many people say, forgive and forget. Oh, I'll never forget. You may never forget, but it doesn't have to hurt when you do remember it. And God can do that. He can leave a painless memory. If you've ever gone to an aquarium and you see, see the uh, jellyfish display, how, you know how the jellyfish are translucent and you can shine light through. In my mind, when I see a jellyfish, I, I, I see something similar that in my mind describes the soul, how, how gentle a jellyfish is. Very, very easily ripped, very easily torn. Jellyfish, they have to stay in very calm waters. That rough water will rip them. And it's just like the soul. The soul will easily rip. And God is the one who can take his hand and make it whole, make it new, leave a painless memory where it doesn't hurt. And so it's, I believe it's the pain that causes the, the festering, the wounded spirit, the, 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 the broken heart and, and it descends into anger and it descends into bitterness and poison and it affects your whole being just like Jonah was. But God has given us his word 
to minister grace to our hearts, to help give us anesthesia of the soul. Offenses are going to come. May we use what God has given us. May we be careful. I, I can tell you the people in my life that uh, after they passed, people around them said, he never got over that hurtful thing back then. He died bitter. Yeah. It'll poison you. It'll poison you. May we guard ourselves. May we use what God has given us to help our hearts heal and get through it and experience his grace. Amen. He loves us. He, he, he allows these things to come into our life so that we can go through the process and enjoy what he can do. And then be able to share that with other people. And because they're going to go through hard things too. And then we can share. This is how God healed me. It was very hurtful. And this is this. this is, these are the details. But this is how God blessed me and healed me. And, and helped me be able to get back up and go on. And do great things. Amen. 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 Let's bow for prayer. And we'll be dismissed. Brother Tony, could you pray for us please? Father, we thank you for this time of message. To remind us, Lord, how we can all fall into the same trap that Jonah did. Reminds us that we don't always love what you love. We don't always want what you want, Lord. We don't always look at people the way you do, Lord. And it's a, a great reminder to us, Lord, when you've asked us to do something, that it's a lot better to, to live in obedience to you than to go through plan B, which is the wilderness experience, or the belly of the whale. Lord, we don't want to do that. We know we sometimes do, Lord, but you make a way for us. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy and being a God of second chances for us, Lord. For we don't always get it right the first time, Lord. We would be more Christ-like this week, Lord, as we interact with our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers, Lord, that they see Christ in us and that we don't repulse them and they, they think that this is what a Christian is and I want nothing to do with it, Lord. May we be mindful people are washing our feet, Lord. And we thank you for all you've done for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.